Hi, good morning to you too. <laughs> good morning! Good morning, Central! Come on, come on. Good morning, yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to, to be given the privilege to share God's Word um, with you. And for today, we're continuing our series uh, of messages um, on the Advent or the coming of Christmas. Do you know that? It's 54 days to go before Christmas. Do you know that? Are we happy? <laughs> okay, it's 54 days. You should be excited. You should be excited because the Lord's, the celebration of the Lord's coming is upon us. Not happy in our pockets, though, but, but, but yeah, I mean, our hearts are filled with joy as we celebrate um, Christmas. I forgot one announcement. At Outside, you know, I've placed like clipboards um, for you to sign, you know, like your, your details, probably your, your name, your, your mobile, and your email. I'm a new pastor here, and I could not uh, repeat that over and over again. I'm, today's my month three, okay? Can we praise the Lord for that? Today's my third month. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right? So it's my third month here in this church. I have access to names of 60 people who are members of the church, you know, like in terms of contact details. But most of those members are probably not here anymore. But uh, so far, I've met, I've met 64 of you on a one-to-one -one or on a one-to-two, one you know, like one, one and two if, if you're a couple. Isn't that amazing? Can we praise the Lord for that? Yes. And my goal is to meet at least 100 by the end of the year, you know, so that I know your story, you know, so that I would know where you are so that I could pray for you. And that will be a great start before we start, you know, 2016. I know where you are. And that's why it's important for you to sign, you know, like your details there. Not everything. And especially the age, you know, I put it in age range, you know, like um, 12 to 18. So you don't need to be specific about how old you are, but we just want to know. Is this congregation really intergenerational? You know, like, yeah, all, all of this stuff. And we would like to know if you're connected to, to a small group as well so that we can, we can make you part of the family. So are you excited about the future? I am. <laughs> okay. Exploring the prophecies and songs and all the wondrous events in Luke chapter 1 and 2 last week was like so-so. Like you know, we, we talked about Theophilus. And we talked about how there are many suggestions of who this guy is. If you, are here, if you were here last week, who, who, think, who among you here thinks that Theophilus is actually you? Could you please raise your hand if you remember last week's preaching? Do you think Theophilus is a representative of you? Okay, there's some like... Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Anyone here who thinks that Theophilus is the priest? Could you please raise your hand? Mm, okay, thank you, Eugene. Anyone here who thinks that Theophilus is a VIP or a very important person, probably a Roman politician or whatever? Very good. And anyone here who thinks that Theophilus is a donor, someone with a dough, with a lot of money to support the writing of Luke and Acts? Anyone? Anyone who doesn't have any opinion whatsoever? I respect you. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. But today, we're going to be discussing about another person, not Theophilus, but it's um, Zechariah. So we're down there. This is an epic seven-part series of messages, and today we're going to discuss about Zechariah with a sermon entitled Fear Not, taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. Esther, right? Esther read it, 25 verses. Can we give, them, give her a hand, please? Yeah? Wow, that was what... As she was reading it, I was like, oh, that, that was really long passage, you know. Thank you so much for reading it, you know, like really good. You know, sometimes, you know, like um, we fall into the rut of like reading the word like, uh, you know, like very monotonous, but she gave it like feelings. That, that was really good. Well done. Well done. Okay, challenge for the Blaze kids, right? So we're going we're gonna to listen to how you read the, the word <laughs> every week. No, no, it's good. You're, you're all doing very well. Okay, let's begin. Okay, so we have Z. See, so he is a priest. He's a Levite, okay? Zechariah, the main guy in our story. He's a Levite. He's an old man. And he was described as righteous and blameless in obedience. Can you beat that, right? Can you beat that? I can't. You know, if we put him in today's context, yeah, he's probably a priest, Catholic priest, probably a Baptist pastor, but I'm way, way off in terms of being righteous and blameless in obedience. I am not like that. But this guy is... 
and that is according to the Bible, together with not just him, but actually his wife. Both are Levites, and they were described as blameless in obedience. As we were singing trust and obey, you know, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if it's just like that? You know, that when, you know, like when we walk in the Lord in the light of His Word, then we're able to trust and obey, right? Maybe these guys can, can do that because they're knowledgeable about the Word. They know their scriptures. They're serving. He's a priest. And they were described as blameless and righteous, you know, righteous and blameless in obedience. Of course, like any other stories, they have a problem, right? What's the biggest problem here? Basically, they're a couple, they're married, and they don't have a child. Okay, Elizabeth is barren, and plus they're old. See, the barren motif in the scriptures is pretty much prevalent. You know, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, if you're barren in those day and age, if you cannot conceive a child, people see you differently. It's almost like the blessings of heaven are withheld from you. And so it's like a social stigma. If women, women could not conceive, unlike in the 21st century, conception is basically, basically a choice, right? It's, it's a choice. People don't get married just to have children. You know, conception or conceiving or procreation is not even an option. It's, it's just an option anymore. I remember, you know, like we lived in Singapore for like um, eight years, and we live in HDB flats, you know, like the high rise. That's why when we moved here in Australia, I said, I don't want to live in a place with a, you know, like... <laughs> landed property. I want to live in an apartment. I'm used to living in an apartment. And you would see there, especially affluent young couples in their 20s, late 20s and 30s, they don't have kids, but they have lots of dogs, right? Dogs and cats. And that's, that's their option. Of course, we don't judge them. And they hire helpers as well. So they have domestic helpers just to take care of the dogs and the cats. And that's like, whoa, lavish, you know, like, wow. <laughs> but that's, that's it. So it's an option. But during that time, okay, kids, I'm just trying to everyone. I'm just trying to put in context here. During that time, it's, it's a stigma. If you are a woman and you're not able to conceive, um, you are looked at differently by the people. Now, the story goes, as we have read this morning, that Zechariah was selected to burn an incense at the tem- temple by lot, by lottery, okay? So he was chosen. So it's like, dun, 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 Zechariah, come on down, you know? It's your time. <laughs> it's your turn to, to offer the incense to the Lord. Um, do you have an, any idea? Have you seen um, incense before? The Chinese peoples use the incense, right? Ancestors, hear our plea, la, 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 whatever. <laughs> Mulan, right? Um, in the Catholic Church, used to be a Catholic, you know, like, do, 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 do. when I was young, you know, I freak out with those smoking, smoke, smoke machines, you know, because I'm like, what is that? But I realized that there is a significance of all of these incense. Okay, this is as far as I can t- get from Google Images in terms of the structure of the temple. During that time, the Holy of Holies, the holy place, and this is the, uh, the lobby or the porch, okay? So the priest enter in. This is a holy place. Is, is there a light here that I can do like that? No, there's not, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> and then that's the holy of Only the high priests can access the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is. Familiar with the Ark of the Covenant, right? That, that relic kind of thing, you know, like from the Old Testament that Indiana Jones was trying to look for, <laughs> you know, in the Temple of Doom. <laughs> anyway, that one. <laughs> that, that's the Ark of the Covenant. Um, our hero, Zechariah, is basically just going here where the, the incense is being lit. And what is the, the belief during that time when you light the incense and the smoke goes up to heaven, the prayers of God's people are heard, carried by angels to God. And that's why probably now you know why, why they put like candles. You know, if you visit a Roman Catholic church, we light candles. Some evangelical churches now light candles as well, not to worship the candles, but as a sign that, you know, like when I pray, there has to be some visual you know, like, I mean, we live in the visual representation. I think that's the, the biggest, biggest tragedy of the Protestant churches. We have shunned away from visuals. You know, we have become so dry and symbolless, right? 
but for the remaining symbols, we are so strict about it. You know, it has to be done properly, right? So, but, but that's, it. that's it. So you light a candle, you remember that these prayers are offered to God. So the same way, I mean, we pray for God's people. This, did you pray this morning for the community prayer? Did you, did you join that? I said, choose any one of those things and pray. So that's your part, and you're offering the prayers to God. So that's it. He was Zechariah, going back to the guy, Z. Z was chosen to light the altar of incense, this, the, the golden lampstands and the, the table of the showbread there. So that's, 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 that's where it is. Okay. This is the porch. Ulam. Ulam in Filipino is like a, it's like a side dish kind of thing. But anyway, sounds like, sorry, <laughs> got distracted there. Okay, so what happened? As he was lighting the altar of incense, boom, there was an apparition. An apparition. Have you met this word before? Apparition. Anyone could give me a synonym or like a counterpart of the word apparition? Come on, shout it out. A vision? Anyone else? Prisons. Okay, that's very good. These are, these are very good. So apparition. Um, there is a manifest visual presence of a supernatural being. Okay? So that's an apparition. Again, taking back from my Catholic roots, remember, they, they, they do recognize the apparition of Mary, I think in the 1940s or the 1950s. Lourdes, you know, like in France, that kind of thing. Um, so supernatural being, boom, appears before you, and that's really what happened. Some people would call it a vision, but I reckon it's more than a vision because a vision could be just some, something like here. This is really visual manifestation of a supernatural being. Do you believe that your religion is supernatural, brothers and sisters? Do you believe that there's that supernatural aspect to your Christianity? Yes or no? Yes. But sometimes we have forgotten about that, right? What if zoom, an angel of the Lord appeared here? How would we react? How would we react? So the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. Would you expect that from him, really? He's a righteous man. He's a priest. Knows his scripture stories. I don't want to call it Bible. The scripture stories from the Old Testament, you know, like angels helping God's people. No angels shutting the mouths of the lions, right? Angels visiting Abraham. But what was his reaction as the angel appeared before him to his side? It's like peripheral vision. There is someone there. <laughs> you know, like, like that guy. He was gripped. With, he was startled. It cannot be like, oh, I am so scared, right? It cannot be like that. Because he's human, right? You and you men. And I believe if the angel of the Lord appears here, I'll be the first one to be like, ah! right? And then we'll be like, how dare you, pastor? How could you? You know, come on. Let's get real here. See, these are as human as we can. He was gripped with fear, right? A man knowledgeable about the word. That's why I was kind of, exegeting, you know, trust and obey. Because yes, we do believe in the Word of God and we know it. But sometimes even our firm footing and holding on to the Word will not be able to prepare us for the unexpected. Right? It won't. And so what happens? You just need to trust. Right? So it cannot be because sometimes it becomes a formula. And I, I don't like it that, you know, like if, 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 if you don't get what you want from God, you'll say, oh, you old lack of faith kind of guy. No, this is supernatural. If something like that happens to you, it's like, whoa, you're going to freak out. But apparently it's not just an apparition. It's also an answer to a prayer. See, do you reckon when he lighted that altar of incense and when he saw the angel, was he even thinking of his prayers? No, he wasn't. The angel of the Lord said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. 
And what do you reckon is the prayer of Zechariah? Anyone? Yeah. Probably pray to have a child. Very good. See, I have one audience here. Thank you so much. It would be nice if our congregation would be like, hey, hey, you know. Like, <laughs> it's good. Interact. Okay, come on. It's going to happen in 2020, right? This is going to be like, woo! You know, like congregation. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the angel of the Lord said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been, Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Isn't that amazing? The guy didn't just have an apparition, a supernatural encounter with an angel of the Lord. He was also told that his prayers have been answered. Do you reckon at that point in time, was he even thinking of that prayer request? I think a lot of times, right? We pray to God, but if those prayers are not answered, we kind of give up, right? We kind of give up. Was the prayer late? Hmm? That's why, brothers and sisters, prayer... Okay, this is controversial. Prayer is a dangerous thing. Let me repeat that. Prayer is a dangerous thing. Why? What happens when you pray? You're actually entrusting your will to the will of God. Remember Jesus' prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not about what you want. Even if you desire something, you are entrusting that desire to God. And then God takes control of it, right? See? God is not like someone whom we can tie and say, God, I want this, I want that, I want a boyfriend, I want a girlfriend, I want to have a baby. doesn't work like that. When you ask those petitions to the Lord, you're entrusting those desires to God, then wait. Wait for God to answer. And it just so happened that God answered at the twilight of his life. <laughs> right? That's it. And even him, probably he wouldn't be able to, to comprehend that. He's just processing the, the image of the angel. And then, whoa, your prayers have been answered. But it's not just a simple prayer. Prophecy was given to him. He said, this is what will happen. Your son will be a joy and delight to you. Many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Hallelujah! You know, that, was, that would be nice. Nice information. And then what? This is what happened to your son. He will never take a fermented drink. He will be filled by the Holy Spirit before he is even born. So again, this one, the challenge here, I, I wrote it down because a lot of times we say, okay, you need to be born again before you be filled up by the Spirit and blah, 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 blah. This guy will, <laughs> will be filled by the Spirit even before he's born. Amazing, right? But what will be the after effect of the infilling of the Spirit? He will bring back many of the people of the Lord, uh, uh, people of Israel to the, to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the Spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents of the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready for the, and to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. Where the Spirit is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of God is, people come. People are drawn. I posted this on Facebook. If we, if this church gives a space for the Spirit of God to come in, people will come in. People will be drawn in. People will respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's, John is the manifestation of that. Being filled with the Spirit, people are drawn to John so that he can point them back to Jesus, you know, when Jesus comes. That's how it is. But again, for a man of the Spirit like Zechariah, for someone who's knowledgeable about the scriptures, for someone who's blameless and righteous, a priest for that matter, maybe all of these three things are too much for him to comprehend. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? So it's not as easy as, you know, like, okay, just trust and obey. Why? Because what happened in the story? Come on, stay with me here. Stay with me before you go to La La Land. Come on, this is very important, brothers and sisters. What happened then? What was his response to the angel, to the answer to the prayer, and to the word of God, a direct word from the Lord? What did he say? Well, dude, I'm kind of old, you know. I am really, really old. And he said, how can I be sure of this? 
Zechariah is us. We are like this. We are like him. See, it's not even about the question of faith, right? A lot of people who say the opposite of faith is doubt, right? No. The opposite of faith is certainty. Because when you're certain and when you're sure, you are in control. And when you are in control, God is not in control anymore. Let me repeat that. That's why in communities like this, control is something that we want to hang on to in all the things that we do. But look at our journey so far. God is removing control from all of us so that we can get, give him that space for faith to rise up again. When things don't go our way, when things don't happen the way we expect, do you have a choice but to trust in the Lord, right? Reflect, brothers and sisters. The Lord is communicating to us here. See, no amount of vision, apparition, an angel, no amount of you being a servant or being a priest, no amount of prophetic word or even the word of God will be able to change your mind if you're not willing to let go and let God take control. And that is the story of Zechariah. He said, how can I be sure of this? Dude, you're inside the, you're, you're inside the temple. You're in the holy, holy place. And there's an angel there. And that's all you can see because I'm old, because I'm young, because I have a family, because I'm busy with my career, because I have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Because, no, because you just want to be in control. Hmm. Heavy messages from the Advent, right? But it's all about that. <sighs> then the angel said to him, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God. I have been sent to you to speak to you and to tell you of this good news. And now you will be silent. You will not be able to speak until the day this happens. Why? Can we read the lines that are there in red? One, two, three, go. Because you did not believe my words, which will actually come through in their appointed time. See. And where is the unbelief coming from? Control. Because he, he just look at himself. I'm old, you know. And this prayer, probably, I've, I've, I've given it to you so many times, maybe it's, it was delayed, you know. But this is part of God's, God's great plan. So what happened? <laughs> muted. Muted. You know what? A lot of times we need to just shut up. Shut up. Remember, I think in the Princess Diaries, the expression, Oh, shut up! Shut up! You know, like that kind of thing. And at that point, I was like, why are they asking each other to shut up? But apparently, that's just an expression of like, really? Seriously? That thing. But you know what? Seriously now, brothers and sisters, sometimes in order for us to encounter the divine and to seek the will of God, we just need to be quiet. Be quiet in the presence of God. So he wasn't able to speak anymore after that. And then, of course, they had a baby, right? <laughs> Again, the blessing. The womb was open. She conceived, you know? And I wonder what was going on in the mind of this guy, Zechariah, as the, the wife, be, you know, I don't know the age. We were not given. Maybe she's 90 or something. 90-year-old having morning sickness, really. How does it look like? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, so she's supposed to be, maybe if, okay, I'm not giving a caricature here. You know, like if, if you're old, and I'm, I'm, I'm older now, and I'm, I'm, I'm very hunchy, actually. So if you're older, you know, the curvature. So if you're old, and if you need to, to have like the, sorry, I'm, I'm a mime artist, so I need to. But how do you do that if you're pregnant? Yeah. 
But they, they had a baby. They had a baby. And he didn't speak until the prophecy was fulfilled. Right? Fear not, church. Fear not, brothers and sisters. Because the Lord is with us. If the Lord is with us, who can be against us? If the Lord is with us, we can do great and mighty things for His glory. So I'm really sorry because, yeah, it, yes, we need to read God's Word. We need to hang into it. But the point of the Word is not for us to have pride and say, okay, I know everything there, but what is that working out that Word in your life? See, the more you read of this Word, the more you should be letting God take control of your life. If it's not happening, then you're reading it like a piece of literature, right? See, a scholar from Princeton or from Oxford, Oxford can have a PhD in the New Testament, but are they Christians? Not necessarily, right? See, it's about the personal relationship with God, and that's the purpose of the Word. I reckon if we have learned so much of the Word, check! Am I, as I walk in my Christian life, as I get older as a Christian, am I letting God take over or it's, it's, it's still me? That's the thing, brothers and sisters. So let's ask ourselves about that. And that's a challenge for us here in this community. To be able to let God take control. To let go of whatever we're holding on, whether it's ministry, whether it's your PhD or MDiv or whatever, or your positions in the church, you cannot hold on to this. Or the heritage of this church, we're celebrating 180 years of, of this church, you know, like next year. But we cannot hold on to the glory days, right? The most important thing is now, and are we able to let go, right? Let it go. I'm so tempted to do that. Let it go. Cannot hold it back anymore. <laughs> no, because some of you are dozing off already. So, yeah. Brothers, that's a challenge of the Advent as we prepare our hearts for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we able to let go completely? So today is a communion Sunday. I know some of you have some anxiety in your heart. What is going to happen, right? Is there something weird that's going to take place today? That is giving God the space to do. Don't worry, I'm, I'm going to do it straightforward. But sometimes we need to be shaken. Sometimes we need to let go. So brothers and sisters, as we sing our communion preparatory song this morning, before we even partake of the communion, let us go before the Lord Jesus Christ and surrender everything to him so that what we're going to do won't be just a ritual but is something that is quite meaningful let us all stand as we